Thank you, Rabbi. I'm so happy to be here. In, I feel like I'm, you know, I, I know so many people in your congregation. You mentioned Sarah and, and, and Lori Klinghoffer and Naomi and David and, and many others. It's really something that uh, I feel here that uh, I came to, to a place that is familiar, although it's my first visit in the actual building. Um, uh, um, I'd like to, to talk this evening uh, uh, about uh, the judicial reform in Israel to put it in a context of uh, today's Zionism and to also to touch uh, some options of uh, people, Jews who live outside of Israel to get involved in, in, in what we do and how to uh, affect the reality on ground in Israel. Uh, um, as, uh, as was said, I'm the vice chairman of the World Zionist Organization. So I'm uh, the deputy of uh, uh, the chair. Um, as we all know, who founded the World Zionist Organization? No? That's the Jewish agency. Herzl, Herzl, indeed. What year? 1897? 1897, where? Basel. Okay, everyone knows Basel, right? That uh, the first Zionist Congress was convened in Basel. Why Basel? Yes, but why Basel? Why did Herzl choose Basel? What? League of Nations. Neutral country. Neutral country, good guess. <laughs> okay. Why Basel? It's funny, you know, it's really yeah, a, piece of, a piece of data that many people remember. Why that Basel, this is what the place, a few people remember or know, or know that uh, Herzl didn't want Basel. Herzl didn't want Basel. Herzl wanted Munich. Herzl uh, uh, was a sophisticated intellectual in, uh, who knew Europe well. He was the political correspondent of the Neue Freie Presse. It's the intellectual newspaper of, of that time in Europe, like the New York Times of, of, of that time. He was placed, posted in, in, uh, in Paris and wrote from there. He knew that the right place to start a new movement, uh, the right place to create the vibe, the right place to create the coverage that he wanted to have would be Munich. That was the intellectual uh, capital of, uh, of that time in Western Europe. He couldn't do it in Munich, excuse me, Rabbi, because of the rabbis. <laughs> the rabbis of Munich, all of them, reform, orthodox, and the beginning of conservative Judaism as well, signed uh, a joint proclamation that was sent to the uh, authorities of uh, Munich with a request to ban the option of having uh, that radical convention of Jews who believe that they should have sovereignty in Eretz Israel in Palestine, uh, uh, to ban that option because it was too radical. Herzl was offended dramatically by those rabbis. Uh, uh, he called them the uh, protest rabbinal, the rabbis of the protest. And, uh, and he was talking about them, but he didn't pick a fight with them and he decided to set his sights to go to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Basel and the uh, history started there. Herzl came to Basel just a few days before the Congress. Now he was working for the Congress for the last 10 uh, uh, months, but uh, uh, he never saw the place and he rented the venue via snail mail. <laughs> okay, this is, people used to do it back then, you know. And, and uh, uh, he, the first thing that he did, he saw the venue. He didn't like the venue. He didn't like the venue because Herzl had a vision how to implement his vision, okay? The vision to how to implement the vision. And one of the things that he really understood was that the place should look like a place where things would, would, would give the people that feeling of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the vision could be implemented. And Herzl uh, uh, knew something about um, um, places of, uh, of uh, holes and places that where people convened. Remember that Herzl was a known writer, but his true passion wasn't journalism. His true passion was theater. theater. You know, he was a playwright, and his true dream was to be the one of the most famous playwrights in Europe of his time. He wrote more than twenty plays. Some of them were even put on stage. 
some of them, not a few of them, none of them was a huge success. He was frustrated because it didn't success. Uh, he wasn't successful in fulfilling his his passion. But he knew quite a lot about theater. He knew about drama. He knew about the magic of theater. And he wanted to give a, a, a chance to this idea to be put on stage in a way that would carry that 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 message and and that uh, uh, magic. He rented. He canceled the reservation for for that hall, and he uh, rented the uh, the Stad Casino. It's not a casino. It's a big, nice theater uh, uh, hall. We were there just a few months ago when we celebrated 125 years for the first Zionist Congress in Basel. It's a wonderful, elegant. Uh, 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 European theater, and for the next <laughs> few days, Herzl was working on the decor, <laughs> that the stage would look like it should look, that the flag will be well placed, the size of the flag. He was working on the three days of the Congress as uh, a one big uh, 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 theater uh, uh, kind of production. And one of the things that he was uh, uh, thinking of is also the dress code. Well, if you got, if you were lucky to get the, uh, the invitation, you would have seen the dress code is frack. Frack is tuxedo. Okay, in, 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 in German, tuxedo with, uh, with a tail, with a white bow tie, not a black one, with a white bow tie and a high hat. Uh, Herzl was really working on giving people the sense that something new is starting in the Jewish world something that would be as far as it could be from a gathering of Jews in the shtetl, speaking Yiddish and uh, talking uh, about uh, things in a way that just Jews could understand. Uh, uh, Herzl spoke Yiddish, uh, uh, not that good, but he could understand. The first Zionist Congress was conducted in German and in French. Everyone could speak their own language, even in English. <laughs> but uh, German was the, the main language of the first Zionist Congress. And uh, it started on August 29th, 10 a.m. Herzl was standing at the entrance, uh, uh, greeting people at 9.30. He saw his deputy coming. Now, I am fond of the deputy because I am the deputy, okay? It's not that I'm the deputy of Herzl, of course, but still, uh, that position, I'm metaphorically sitting on that chair. The deputy of Herzl in the First Dynasty Congress was Nordo, Dr. Max Nordo, physician. And uh, he saw Max Nordo, his deputy, coming with a light suit, not with a tuxedo. He was requested to, he was furious. He took him to the side. He spoke with him. After 10 minutes, uh, Nordo went back to his hotel, came back with a tuxedo. They hugged. Herzl wrote it in his diary, and the Congress began. What happened in the Congress, in the first Zionist Congress, was that Herzl changed. People that knew him before noticed that it's not the same Herzl. And for the next seven years, Herzl will be playing the role of his life. The way he conducted himself during the Congress, the way he moved on the stage, the way he deliberated the conversations, the way he approached people, it was a presidential figure. And he was playing that role in a, in a way that engaged people, even people who came to the Congress to dispute him. And some came to the Congress, they, they read the, Jew, the Judenstadt, uh, the Jewish state, his publication, and didn't agree. They came to the Congress to dispute him, almost all of them, except of one, Chada'am. It's a known story that is not for this uh, uh, talk. Uh, they were taken by the idea. They were, they were leaving the first Zionist Congress, even if they didn't uh, agree with Herzl in the beginning, in a way that we should give it a chance. Now, Herzl was able to bring to the, Zionist, to the first Zionist Congress 209 delegates from uh, most parts of the world, not all, but most parts of the world. He was insisting to have as many walks of life, as many uh, uh, ideas, streams to be together around the table. And he gave us a gift. Only seven years he survived after the first Congress. He passed away in a young age of 44. But in the seven years that he led us, he uh, uh, gave us a gift that uh, uh, really changed uh, the ability of his idea to uh, be implemented. He politicized the movement. He introduced politics into the Zionist movement. Herzl wasn't the first Zionist. Zionism existed before him. The first wave of Aliyah to Israel was in 1882. So he joined the movement that already existed. But what he did, he politicized the idea in a way that made it effective. How effective? Less than 50 years after Herzl passed away, the state of Israel was established. 
So why the fact that, that that political idea that he introduced and 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 he taught us to look up to politics, not to look down, and to make sure that we do our business correctly and we do our business even if we fight with each other in a way that would allow ideas to be implemented. Now, uh, uh, um, one of the things that he really insisted on were, was, was democracy. The first Zionist Congress, people were invited, men and women alike, okay, were invited. They weren't elected. From the second Congress on, you had to be elected. The homework that the, that the, the, get, <clears throat> that the delegates were, giving, were given at the end of the first Congress was to go back home to their hometowns, to their cities, to establish Zionist federations and to be elected or not be elected. So you had to have a constituency in order to be present in, in the second Congress, a key element of democracy. The second is women rights. We are among the, the, the first uh, uh, political uh, movements in the world that gave women the right to vote from the second Congress on, the right to vote and the right to be elected. In your country, in the States, it's, uh, when, when did women get the right to vote? 20, 1920, other democracies even later in Switzerland, 1972. Okay, as late as 1972. So uh, it gives reasons to be proud of the Zionist endeavor from the very beginning. A, the fact it was connected, but B, the fact that democracy was part of who we are, of our identity from the very, very, very beginning. Therefore, it's not a coincidence that in 1948, when the, we, we signed the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence that anchored the democratic uh, nature of uh, the Zionist endeavor as a, as a state, it was something that was quite natural. In the middle of Milchemet Atzma'ut, in the middle of the War of Independence, we took a break, sort of a break, and signed the protocol of how do we want to conduct this business. Unfortunately, it wasn't legislated as a constitution, but still, this is a declaration of independence that we should be proud of. And when you take the line between those two dots, first Zionist Congress that, that, that introduced politics and introduced democracy into that uh, idea with 1948, when you connect the dots, you truly understand why in the last three or four months in Israel, people feel that someone touched their nerve in a way that they cannot tolerate. When people understood that the judicial reform that is not necessarily a judicial reform but more of a regime change when it was introduced people felt hey this is something that cannot be touched now it's a dilemma our government in israel was just elected okay after five after four rounds of elections that the israeli voter did not decide where they want to go okay the fifth round of elections had a, a, a firm decision. Okay, 64 mandates to the uh, to one side of the equation. Uh, uh, it was clear to us in the night of the elections that uh, uh, we will have for the first time the most homogenic kind of uh, uh, government Israel will ever have. Okay, uh, uh, the right wing and the extreme right wing joining the orthodox parties and the extreme orthodox parties in one coalition that Israel never had. We Many of us, okay, uh, 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 could not sleep that night, <laughs> you can imagine. Uh, uh, we understood that some of the ministers in the coming coalition would be ministers that it will be hard for us to, to look at the mirror and to believe that they are ministers in the Israeli government. But uh, uh, it was duly elected. No one contested the results. There are some democracies where we do not contest the results. Uh -huh. but, uh, <laughs> it, 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 no, no one thought that there is a fraud. And, and, and uh, we then argued it will be hard for us in the next coming years, you know, to deal with things that we thought that we know what would they do. And when it comes to the arena of that I was dealing uh, uh, in for so many years, state and religion, you know, the, the, we, we thought that it would be even harder when it comes to uh, the stature of, uh, of um, reform and conservative converts, when it comes to the Kotel, when it comes to uh, the ability of um, our rabbis to officiate a wedding in Israel, to our uh, uh, right to equal funding that was never fulfilled. You know, many things that we thought these would be the issues, it will be maybe harder. No one thought that these issues will be pushed aside by a much bigger issue that became uh, uh, our reality. When uh, Netanyahu convened the heads of his coalition, the day that he sworn in the, uh, his government, he was talking about three elements or three ideas or three things that he would like to achieve in the coming years with his government. He spoke about Iran 
Okay, definitely it's something you so uh, associated with the battle against the Iranian nuclear bomb. The second thing that he talked about is the cost of living in Israel. Israel is expensive. If you visited Israel recently, you would notice that a cup of coffee would cost you way more than it costs in, in Starbucks. Okay, Israel is expensive place to live in. It's something that bothers Israelis. It was part of Netanyahu campaign, as well as uh, uh, the nuclear uh, uh, bomb in Iran. And the third thing was the governance in the Negev. Okay, we have a problem with law enforcement in the Negev. It's a known issue. It was talked about uh, uh, in the Netanyahu's campaign. So these were the issues that he brought to the table. So even in the day that he sworn in the coalition, it wasn't uh, uh, um, introduced. So when I talked about the dilemma of what do you do with a government that is elected democratically and duly, and still you feel that something here is, is too dramatic to tolerate, and uh, uh, it happened when we understood that he would like to change the rules of the game of democracy to break the contract between a, a civil, uh, a, you know, a, a civilian and 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 uh, their country. Uh, <clears throat> Yariv Levin is the minister of uh, justice. Yariv Levin introduced that reform that evening that we all remember. All Israelis that, uh, remember, and slowly but surely we understood that it's not a judicial reform. It is basically more of a regime change that would uh, change uh, uh, the checks and balances that we do have in Israel. Israel is a unique democracy. We never had three agencies from the very beginning. Okay, it doesn't mean that it's, it could not function without three agencies, but the fact that we do not have three agencies, meaning there is no uh, 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 the court, the government, or the parliament, uh, uh, in some 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 uh, democracies, there are even two houses. Okay, in Israel, uh, we have a court, and the government and the parliament are linked. Most of the ministers are also members of the Knesset, members of the parliament. So basically, we always had two agencies. Okay, to begin with, it's not a great beginning, but still, we had a very a balanced kind of equation. We did have checks and balances. Uh, uh, um, what did Netanyahu introduce, or Yariv Levin introduced in his uh, uh, reform? There are about 50 articles. I'll talk about, I'll touch only about uh, um, uh, three of them. One of them was the um, uh, uh, the change in the status or the stature of, uh, of legal advisors in the different ministries uh, from civil uh, service professionals like we have in Israel. Uh, by the way, it's so different from the United States. Here in the United States, when the new administration is being elected, all the senior positions in the government are changed. You know, many people live Washington. Maybe pe many people come to Washington. In, in English, we are more like the British system without the accent. Uh, 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 the British system, so uh, um, a strong cadre of civil service uh, legal advisors that are the gatekeepers in each and every ministry. Okay, uh, they are the ones who help the minister implement his or hers policy. They are bowing to him as well as bowing to the law. The judicial reform uh, introduced a change that each minister will be able to bring his or hers uh, uh, a private lawyer with the same ethics of a lawyer client client kind of relationship. Uh, something that uh, uh, a key element of our checks and balances. In a, in a system that doesn't have three agencies would, would be pushed aside. The second thing was the overall right, the ability of the uh, parliament to veto a decision of the Supreme Court and not even in a royal uh, um, uh, majority, but in a regular majority of 61. Now, uh, this is even more dramatic because in Israel, we do not have three agencies, but there are democracies that they do have this overall right, okay? It exists, I think it exists in, in Canada and it exists in New Zealand, but in, in those countries, uh, there is a constitution or a protected uh, bill of rights. In Israel, we do not have three agencies. We do not have a constitution. We do not have a protected bill of rights. So any change in the checks and balances that we do have in our system, uh, uh, it's 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 a big drama. So the overall right in a regular majority, it's a big change in who we are. It would basically allow every government to do whatever it wishes because every government has 61 vote, um, seats in the Knesset at least. So it, it makes the law more of a... The third thing 
uh, uh, is, is the core of the judicial uh, reform that they introduced uh, had to do with a committee that elects judges in Israel from the 60s. We have uh, a very unique system how to elect uh, judges. We have 15 Supreme Court judges in Israel. They are elected by a committee of nine, three Supreme Court judges, four politicians, three of them from the coalition, one from the opposition, and two representatives of the bar. In order to have a judge elected, you have to have a, a majority of at least seven. It means that both the judges and the politicians can veto each other, okay? It forces the room to come to terms with decisions, to deliberate, to get consensus. It, it, it creates a mechanism that takes a while to elect a Supreme Court judge. Now, it created a superb Supreme Court that we have in Israel, a Supreme Court that is often quoted in other judicial systems. And our Supreme Court, in spite of the myths that are uh, attached to it today, is not an ultra-liberal progressive Supreme Court. Without the Supreme Court in Israel, one settlement could not have been built. Okay, so to call it a Supreme Court that is ultra-liberal, it's, it's a myth. Uh, there is a good balance between more conservative judges to more liberal judges, and you can see how uh, things are coming from that court, and, and they're quite balanced. It's not that it's a uh, perfect uh, Supreme Court. There are some, some, some things that I would have changed. Like, it doesn't represent in an equal way all the sectors of the population. This is true. Uh, 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 when it comes to women, it, they're represented. I think it's 50% or almost 50%. But when it comes to Sfaradi judges, it's not as represented as it should be. This is true. When it comes to Arab judges, it's not as represented. There's only one Arab judge, and we have 20% 20, uh, uh, Arab, uh, 20 uh, Arabs in Israel. When it comes to settlers, though, they are well represented, three judges. So a radical, ultra radical Supreme Court. Now, it's challenging to have a superb Supreme Court when the first thing that you'd like to see in that Supreme Court that all sectors of the population are represented, okay? Because it might lead, it might lead to a, a situation where you have a token representative only because you want that representative to be there. So it's a balance that when you have only 15, it takes time to change because everyone knows that the Supreme Court must be you know, must reflect the, the, the population in Israel. Uh, uh, when you need to choose between compromising on uh, uh, the quality of the judge, then, then if he or she is representing a sector, there is like, it takes more time to change it. So I'm sure that within 10 years, it would be differently. There are way more people that are appointed now to the to the other uh, uh, courts, to the uh, local, how do you say, local courts and the district call, uh, uh, courts, and they will be eventually getting to the Supreme Court. It takes time. And I'm sure it will be. So it's not flawless, but it's quite good. And when you read the, the, the rulings, you see that uh, we have Shoftim uh, Birushalayim. There are judges in Jerusalem, as Begin uh, uh, used to say. So these are the three elements. And when they were introduced, we saw people rallying in the streets. I came here, I flew to, to the States on Motei Shabbat at 9, 1 a.m. Uh, until 10 p.m., I was in Kaplan Street with my drum, with my flag, like I, like I did in the last uh, 20 weeks, uh, uh, every Motei Shabbat. And the peak of it was in uh, April 27, when Netanyahu you know, wanted to fire his Minister of Defense for speaking against the judicial reform, not because Gallant is such a left winger, okay, because he understood that the ramifications on the IDF, on the reserves, would be too dramatic. And he felt, as an ex-general, as the one who is, you know, the, as the Minister of Defense of the State of Israel, that he must speak up. Netanyahu wanted to fire him that evening. That evening, 700,000 Israelis went to demonstrate in the streets. It was the, the evening that no Israeli will forget. 700,000, it's 10% of the Jewish population in Israel. Okay, it's huge. One of the funniest uh, signs, by the way, it's very creative. I'm sure that you see, you know, each time you see a different sign, people are writing signs and bringing to Kaplan Street and to other places all over Israel. So one of the most uh, <laughs> funniest signs that I saw from that evening was a young woman that uh, was, I, I will say it in Hebrew, and then I'm going to translate it, not a full translation, with your permission, to, to, to English. So she, she, she wrote there, uh, uh, 
סמק, כבר הייתי במיטה. דאם, אני הייתי כבר בבית. זאת הייתה... And it's true, it was 10 p.m. and all night, you know, uh, 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 Meital, who is uh, working with me at WZO, came back uh, that morning after the full night, all wet because of the hose, hose, you say? Yeah. Because of the hose, uh, my, my son as well, my wife as well, everyone, were, you know, the, the, the police were so tense. It's not that the police were, was, was against or fighting. The, the police also was tense. You know, they never saw such a big crowd. I can understand them for, for, for being, uh, I don't know, it's, It happens. No, no, one, no one is angry with, with the police. So okay, it's, it's fine. The incidents that we had with the police were not that terrible. Uh, are the police in other countries, for those well, that scope of, uh, of demonstrations, you would have seen people killed. Okay? We never saw it in Israel uh, in, that, uh, um, in the last few uh, months because of demonstrations. So this is something also to, to, to bear in mind. Uh, now we are in a, in a, in a kind of uh, uh, freeze. Uh, uh, Netanyahu uh, froze it. tabled it for a while. Uh, there is negotiations in the president's house. I'm not sure that it would bear fruit. I'm almost sure that it will not bear fruit. I think that uh, um, um, the risk is, and this is why we keep demonstrating every week, the risk is that, uh, um, that uh, the Netanyahu could go back to legislation within seconds. Okay, soon after the budget passed, and tonight his budget uh, uh, passed, soon after it happens, it might be that he'll go back to legislation and it will force us to be as uh, forceful as we were up until uh, uh, now. Uh, this is what we are doing in Israel. I think, guys, that you have uh, a role here too. I believe that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. I was educated. That Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people uh, um, from kindergarten. Uh, uh, but by the way, Mital, if you could pass, well, we'd like to be in touch with you because this kind of uh, political engagement is, is important. So uh, uh, um, uh, um, I'm, I'm spreading uh, up, uh, we're, we're circling uh, uh, a piece of paper. There are things to do. Now, uh, I, I would like. To, to share with you things that I think, uh, what I think about things that you can do. And I'll start from the most obvious. The most obvious is uh, uh, thinking well about your charities to Israel. Meaning, uh, and I know that some federations are doing it uh, uh, already and some individuals are doing it already. Uh, um, Israel doesn't need uh, um, uh, philanthropy to help with our IDF. doesn't need philanthropy to help with our uh, health system or security system or whatever. Not that it's not important, not that it doesn't connect people to Israel, I get it, but what Israel definitely needs is an investment in uh, uh, programs of democracy and humanities and, uh, and uh, civil rights and Jewish pluralism. Okay, so make sure that when donations are going to Israel, first and foremost, maybe not solely, but first and foremost, it would be to enhance the civil society in Israel when it comes to to uh, uh, democracy. My favorite charity is, of course, the Masorti Movement in Israel and Jewish pluralism in Israel. It's so needed and uh, it's uh, needed more than ever today. Secondly, uh, uh, it's about uh, raising your voice. You cannot imagine how good we feel, the demonstrators in Kaplan, when we see uh, Israelis overseas and Jews overseas uh, gathering on Sundays with the same flags And with the same signs and calling for Israel's democracy, it's not demonstrations against Israel. It's demonstrations for Israel. It's a, a patriotic kind of act that we do in Israel. And I think it's only right for uh, people to do it, people who love Israel, okay, for us to do it from, from that side of the ocean. We never, uh, in, uh, you know, we never pushed for that before because uh, it wasn't as needed. But what we have now in Israel is so unprecedented that some unprecedented measures are definitely in place. And it leads me to the third element of, of my uh, um, uh, ideas of how to, to, to influence, and it has to do with politics here. Engaging with local politicians in America, the ones that love Israel, either Democrats, Republicans, the ones that love Israel, not the ones that are against Israel to begin with, it's, it's a waste of time and it's even dangerous, but the ones who love Israel. to have them pick up the phone discreetly or not discreetly to their peers in Israel and talk to them about how 
dangerous that might be, how strategically it threatens Israel's relationship with the world and especially with North America. For so many years, Israel was celebrating the fact that we are the only democracy in the Middle East. Can we really celebrate it and Israel cease to be a democracy? And we know democracy is not only uh, going to elections. There are elections in Poland, there are elections in Hungary, there are elections in Turkey. These are not democracies, for sure not liberal democracies. Okay, democracy that doesn't respect uh, uh, the rights of the minority is not a democracy. Or it's way less than, than democracy that none, each of, none of us could, could, could live in. Uh, uh, um, if Israel is not the liberal democracy that uh, it is, we could not share the same values with other liberal democracies, and it would threaten the stability of the state of Israel as well as the ability of the state of Israel to strategically uh, uh, live in the dangerous neighborhood that, that we live in, in, in the Middle East. So this is something that uh, I feel uh, uh, it's an unprecedented request, okay, to, to uh, uh, very cautiously um, conduct the conversation with, if you have any connections with uh, uh, um, your elected officials to do so. I, I think that uh, 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 organizations that never did it before did it. I'm talking about the leadership of JFNA, who uh, uh, wrote a letter uh, that was never written before to the state of Israel on matters that are not religion and state, okay? The leadership of APA did it very discreetly, but I know what was in the room when the, they came to Israel and conducted a very serious conversation with the Prime Minister Netanyahu. And they came to, especially, to talk about the judicial reform. So uh, it is unprecedented and therefore it, it, it needed. Uh, 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 and APAC is very cautious, you know, maybe over conservative, right? And, you know, APAC is APAC. If you love it, you love it. If you less, uh, uh, there, it's a different sphere, uh, thing, but they, they they never did what they did before, and I I I, I salute them for doing it. Uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, for J Street to do it, it's not a big deal because uh, uh, they did it for many years, and and you know I can I can understand, but they, they will not have influence at all on the current government of Israel. Okay, the current government of Israel, APAC might have, uh, and a call from a Republican to one of the ministers would be way more effective than a call from a democratic uh, uh, politician. Uh, so, so we need to play with the cards that, uh, uh, that we have. Uh, thirdly, uh, uh, the, the last thing uh, of, uh, I talked about three uh, uh, options or three paths. The last thing has to do with the Zionist Congress. Herzl left us with a gift. And that gift, is the uh, uh, the, me the, polit the, the the political mechanism that he left us, left us with, that allows Jews from all over the world not only to have a voice in Israel but also a vote in Israel. Our ability to vote to the World Zionist Organization and it's an ability that only Jews who live outside of Israel have. Okay, we Israelis, we vote to the Knesset and the delegates from the Knesset are going to the Congress. So the third of the Congress is Israelis, a third is the US and a third is the rest of the world, Latin America and, and, and Europe and Africa and Asia and, and Canada. By the way, Canada is not counted with, uh, with the state. So uh, this is the Congress. And, and it means that Jews who live outside of Israel can influence what's happening in Israel. And, and uh, uh, um, it is something that it's not like voting to the Knesset. This is true. You cannot elect the government of Israel, but you have influence on things that are definitely done and conducted in Israel. And it's big. It's not small. Okay. The World Zionist Congress is like the umbrella that Herzl put together. It has three daughter, daughter companies. One is the Jewish agency that some of us know well. <laughs> the Jewish agency, 50% uh, uh, of the Jewish agency that does Aliyah, that does program to Israel, that does partnerships, that does Shlichim, you know, 50% of the board of governors of the Jewish agency with a budget of $400 million or a little less, 50% is the Zionist Congress. Okay? Meaning when you vote to the Zionist Congress, you have 50%, uh, you are a shareholder of 50% in the Jewish agency. The same 50% of the board of governors of Kirin Ayesod, it's the second daughter company, less known in Israel in, in, in the state, so it's not that important here, but it's like the JFNA system of raising funds in the rest of the world. Okay, 50% of the Board of Governors there is also uh, uh, um, um, the World Zionist Organization, and 100%, not 50, 
but 100% of the board of governors of the third daughter company is the World Zionist Organization. And it's Keren Kayemet Israel, Kakal, JNF. Now, this is the most important of all due to its budget. The budget of Keren Kayemet Israel on a yearly basis is more than $2 billion. I sit on the directorate on the board of KKL. I'm one of 37 board members. Our annual budget to allocate flexible money, okay? It's to be over $2 billion a year. The money doesn't come from donations. It comes from the uh, uh, the blue box that our Bobbies and Zadies put uh, and, 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 and land was bought in Israel. And that land, 17% of the land of Israel is owned by Keren Kemet Israel. And when there is development, the proceeds go to Keren Kemet Israel. And in the last few years, it's over $2 billion a year, a huge amount. Now, this money doesn't belong to Israelis solely. It doesn't belong at all to the government of Israel. It belongs to the Jewish people. It belongs to you as much as it belongs to me. And, and when you have a control on such monies, when you have a control over the Jewish agency, or at least 50%, when you have a control, it means that you have skin in the game, that your ability to, to make changes is important, A, to allocate funds to things that we think that, uh, uh, that we should have, and B, to, to block things, okay? Uh, um, I'll share with you something that rightly we didn't celebrate, but I feel that especially in this congregation, it will be understood how dramatic it is, a few months ago, uh, uh, over the, uh, the the table of Keren Kemet Israel, that was there was an attempt, a desire of the right wing and uh, uh, the Orthodox parties to build an amphitheater at the entrance of the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in East Jerusalem. If you know Jerusalem, the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood is one of the most tensed places in, 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 in Jerusalem. If they would have built this amphitheater, it could have blown the Middle East. Okay, it's... Uh, and when we heard about it, we did whatever we could to, to, to stop it. And our and we were able to, to, to create a coalition with some others and to, to negotiate with some other parties. And to, we were able to block it. And our, our, our demand was, or our claim was, that if the government of Israel wants to build an amphitheater, the entrance of Sheikh Jarrah, the government of Israel can do it with its own money. It's... It's their decision. It's fine. The government of Israel could do many things. But you cannot do such a thing with the money of the Jewish people. When it comes to money that is not only uh, owned by Israelis only, you know, it means that you need to work within the ranks of consensus. And doing such a thing would alienate so many people that are, it's their money as well. It's your money as well. And, and I'm, I'm so happy that it was uh, uh, that we were able to achieve it. We are not celebrating it, not because we don't want to encourage the other side to to do that. Okay, so we are, but but boy, it's it's it's. I think it celebrates our values in the most profound way. This is to block things, to promote other things too. We 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 increase the budget that goes to uh, environment, to fighting the climate change by four. Okay, we doubled and doubled. Okay, uh, uh, by four. It's again drama that we never had in in KKL. Uh, and other things that we can go into details. Now, my fear is that what we learned in the last elections to the WZO will be even worse in 2025. Uh, um, for the first time in the history of Zionism, the liberals were not a minority anymore, are not a minority anymore. I, I, excuse me, I'm not a majority anymore. They're not a majority anymore. What happened? is that for the first time, there was a Haredi slate that ran to the Congress in North America. The name is Eretz Kodesh. And they got, for the first time that they ran, they decided to join the Zionist movement from the right reasons, from the wrong reasons. They did what they needed in order to join. So what can we say? But they joined the Zionist movement and they ran a slate to the Congress and they were able to achieve 25,000 votes in the first time that they ran. Now, 25,000 votes, it sounds big, it sounds small. Compare it to what uh, uh, what we got, we got, I'm representing Merkaz. If you voted for Merkaz in the Congress, I thank you because you allowed me to do what I do. Uh, uh, in Merkaz, the Masorti Conservative slate for the Congress got 15,000 votes. 
The reform movement got 23,000 votes in the States. Nothing, nothing, really. Amenu did how many votes? Yes, but uh, we increased our percentage because there were so many that voted. It didn't matter. We got eighty thousand, uh, a few thousands, right? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was it was hundreds. It went to a few thousands, but nothing compared to the potential. You know, most of Jews in North America are liberals, are progressives, are are either uh, you know are on the liberal side of the equation of, of who we are. The fact that they were so ap ap apathetic, the apathy almost killed us. And thank God we were able to create a coalition and to work together with our partners and to create some kind. But what would happen in the next Congress? The risk is huge. And we are looking for ways to, to, to encourage congregations and other organizations to make sure that, that in the next uh, uh, elections in January, February of 2025, the apathy will not kill us. The, the campaign that is most important is a go vote campaign. Of course, I want you to vote Merkaz, but regardless of whom you vote, if we increase uh, 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 the percentage of voters in North America, it would serve the more liberal part of the equation. And this is something that is uh, dramatic. Uh, uh, um, it has to do with the last thing that I would say, it has to do with money. Okay, just imagine that from the money that you guys are its owners as much as I am, a good portion would go to uh, uh, Zionist and, and Jewish programs outside of Israel. If $200 million would have been invested in Jewish education in North America, from the money that you are its owners do, wouldn't it be a dramatic uh, uh, change here? Lowering the cost of uh, camping in the summer or uh, or um, um, Jewish education or informal education, just, just, just dream. Things that, that are achievable, if we will have enough seats around that table, especially in KKL, 100% of the seats are ours, we will be able to create a significant change when it comes to, to, to our funds, to our ability to, to, to work on that, those funding. So this is the drama. This is the situation in Israel when it comes to the democracy. This is the dimension where you can be very, very effective. Again, not only a voice, but also a vote. And uh, I would love to, to get to 2025 uh, or to end the year 2025 in the coming Congress in October with uh, a feel that we achieved a lot and our ability to create there a coalition that is way more balanced with our partners, with, uh, with uh, Amenu and Al Seinu and, uh, uh, and, and other parties that, that could join in a way that will be able to go back to, to the days where we had uh, a majority there. Unfortunately, we didn't know how to use that majority back then. Now, boy, we learned the lesson. So it will be a different kind of uh, uh, national institutions. Uh, I'm stopping here. Uh, uh, remarks, questions, ideas. This is the time. No. Um, I speak to you first. Okay, I don't have that. Okay, so I had a, a two question. Yeah. Multiple things. One, right, the biggest problem with really with areas of Kodesh and Kodesh, as we all know, they're anti Zionist, like that, that's kind of in the weeds, is that we don't have the Are the black hats who, who decided very astutely before this last election that they would run in the Zionist Congress, even though at the same time they were writing in Yiddish that we're anti Zionist? I can say these things, these are can't, this is you know, my home. Um, uh, that we are anti-Zionist, but in order to get all this money, we're going to pretend we're Zionists to play the game. And and we have those quotes and, you know, we go back and forth with them a lot. But at the same time, I work with them at the AZM and so does their cause, and we're, we're all there trying our best. So first of all, you should also know that Eric Zekwich has already said that there's $3 million that they are putting towards this campaign. And we, on the center left, um, as far as I'm concerned, need to work together even as one big group, because if there's a lesson that we learn from the Zionist Congress and also that we could learn from the Israeli parliamentary system and Bibi, for example, is that the center right will always go around Bibi and we have too many leaders who want to be the left president or the center <laughs> prime minister. So until we decide who that's going to be, we're going to still be in this position. 
Also, unfortunately, we don't have as many kids as any of these um, Eretz and Kodesh families, so we are already facing that number. So again, I think this is a congregation that did vote um, in the last election. Um, you know, we ran programs here, David ran them too, where we said, we need you to vote. You can vote for Merkaz, you can vote for Amenu, you can vote for whatever we need you to vote. And I think that that is really the message in the synagogue. And I think one of the reasons, and this is a this synagogue is a perfect example of this, is that we have multiple loyalties in North America. And in North America, we have those. And really, in other countries in the world, they don't have those, right? So the Masorti people uh, in Brazil, that is where they go, right? The Wixo people go. But here, you can be a member of this synagogue and a member of Amenu and a member of Adasa that was written or a member of the Amat. Um, and those you don't vote for, but, but that's our problem. So I think that that is something that we need to understand about the North American community that is not properly understood in Israel. And that is one of the things that has to be understood. And that's why I still maintain the more we do together, the stronger we are. My, my second one is really a question for you, and that is and for you to talk about. So for those that do not know, uh, we voted in the last two days from the World Zionist Congress, um, and we did uh, extremely well. Uh, we only lost on one resolution, really, and that was because we worked very hard and had this very wide. What did we lose? We the one lose. three, which was the one, by the way, that never got out of the bot that I was in, which was this area one. It wasn't a bad resolution. It's true that it was introduced. I by the know, it never got passed. Shouldn't vote. It doesn't matter. Yeah, we but it's, it's, it's not. Not. You, if you read it, you it's not don't like even it. know that it came from the Likud because we it's watered not. it down so dramatically. Right. But my question to you is this: We we passed some uh, as you, we passed amazing resolutions. Then there's articles in our that have been posted that have already come out that have said. You know, we said we wanted said no to to um, um, law of conversion laws and the grandparent and all of those wonderful things, which are really wonderful. And we also passed something on LGBTQ plus programming. So I say to you, Vice Chair of the WZO, how are we going to implement these important um, resolutions? Because that is how we're going to re-engage and yeah. ignite this North American. So great, great, great remarks. The, the first thing uh, that I could say about uh, uh, um, how do we encourage the voting? So th there are two things that we are thinking of strategically. One, we could never convince the federations in North America to be heavily invested in calling out for people to vote. I think that they get it now, what they didn't get before. They see it, uh, uh, what's happening at the Board of Governors of the Jewish Agency with Eretz Kodesh, and they understand that in many ways it's in their hands. So uh, I do, when I meet Federation leadership, and I did it with in New York, in Los Angeles, and other places, I see that they do get it, and the leadership of JFNA definitely gets it, that towards the coming elections, they will be advocating, I hope, dramatically and firmly with a go-vote campaign. It would touch more people. Secondly, about your, uh, uh, and also Hadassah will, will do it. Okay, Hadassah, uh, they do not run, but Hadassah have 300,000 uh, 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 affiliates in North America, 300,000. I know that, but, but there are but the majority, of, today I said with the leadership of us, the majority of their women are reforming conservative uh, um, uh, women. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and if, if the leadership of Hadassah would be as firm as it should be, just with a call vote kind of campaign, uh, of course, they will not say to whom, I hope it will also help. So Federation and Hadassah, it's, it's two big uh, um, membership um, organizations. Vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis your other uh, uh, remark, the, the, the resolution that we just passed, please log on Jerusalem Post and speak at line of Jerusalem Post and Judy Maltz in Haaretz and read about the resolution that we just passed, it's a drum. The Zionist movement decided jointly in a vast majority that the law of return should not be changed, that the judicial, the judicial reform is a disaster, that LGBTQ rights should be protected in Israel and in the Zionist movement, that women uh, representation in the Zionist movement should increase from 30% mandatory to 40% mandatory. Uh, um, uh, uh, what else, that reform and, and uh, conservative uh, uh, Conversion should be uh, uh, equally things that uh, are really stunning when you have this myth about the Zionist movement that went right and right and right. 
because we proved that when we are together as the Jewish people, we bring up uh, good resolutions that are definitely uh, uh, liberal. Important, important. Uh, uh, um, uh, and, and engage our people. The people, our delegates, and your delegates, and everyone delegates, when they came to the last Zionist Congress, they felt that they are changing uh, important things. They felt engagement with the thing, with their values, and the things that they can uh, uh, achieve. I hope to resonate that it would resonate to the coming elections. Israel is now fighting for its soul when it comes to democracy. This uh, 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 winter that we had in Israel, the winter of 2023 is as important as the summer of uh, 1948 and the winter of 1973, okay? We are now in our second war of independence. Thank God with no bloodshed, but still. And, and the Zionist Congress allowed the delegates in that Congress and hopefully the voters that would come in 2025 to be active members on who we are. It, 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 sometimes uh, the, the headlines do, uh, do make an impact. And uh, uh, you saw that Bibi could not come to speak, not in the Zionist Congress and not in the GA two days later. He could not come to, to, to speak to the first time, the first GA that was in Israel that the prime minister didn't speak. And it was also because what happened in the Zionist Congress two days before, when we stood up and said, Busha, 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 and it was hundreds of people that he and knew that if he marched. And, and when we marched. And when we marched, it, so, so it, you know, you have again a voice and a vote, and we should materialize it. You had the remark, Reva. Uh, two, two questions for you. Based on, I think, these resolutions that you said that were voted on uh, by, by, the, by the World Bank Congress, because of each other, the World Bank Congress influences uh, financial distribution of programming in, in, in Israel. How do those resolutions make sure that? Uh, in uber rights, ultra rights wing governments, isn't still implementing policies uh, and, and legislation that changes the law of return, that still won't recognize con uh, conversions by, uh, or, uh, by, by conservative or reform allies, that uh, is, is still confiscating a tourist scroll on Sunday morning for the woman of the wall at the, at the hotel, you know, that, that sort of I would lie to you if I would say that it can stop it. It cannot. But as we saw, when the prime minister wanted to sack his minister of defense, he could do it. But in fact, he could not do it. Okay. So sometimes uh, our we, we, the, the tools that we have are civil activism. This is the, the toolbox that we have. And the way to do it uh, sometimes is very, very effective. And we collectively, as the Jewish people, bring up uh, uh, such a set of resolutions. Uh, 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 it cannot force anyone, but it definitely sends a very firm message. So, uh, um, um, and, 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 and it is well, well heard. It might be that the political uh, um, uh, needs of the prime minister would um, push him not to listen. Yes, could be. It's so not the same, Netanyahu. Like, one of the resolutions on the LGBTQ plus, right, was the WCO will have people march in the gay pride group. That was part of the resolution. Do you think between you, is that, I mean, it's not going to happen, right? That, yeah, well, well, why not? Well, I'm hoping, and I know who's going to lead it. I, I, can, I can tell you that on the day of the parade of the uh, uh, of the gay of the pride parade in in Jerusalem is June first. Okay, we will be standing with flags on the balcony that Ben Gurion stood. Okay, in the middle of the of the and we will wave flags. Whatever we are still negotiating with the Jewish agency, by the way, because according to the we we are in the same building. The Jewish agency, Karen Ayesod, Karen Kemet Israel, but the one who run the building, according to a contract of many years, it's the Jewish agency. We are still deliberating a conversation with them about having the um, um, uh, the pride flag on the building for the entire week or even for the day. Right now, they are not in, in consensus with it. The resolution that just passed would force them to deal with it. Okay, and the Jewish agency, like any other political, or, like any other organizations, the political organizations, if we are able, and we are still hesitant if we should do it to, to, to rally with key federations, 
to ask the Jewish agency, would they you, they consider to open their arms to the LGBTQ community in spite of Eretz Kodesh? I think that at the end of the day, they will do it. Uh, uh, we are giving it still a few days to the, uh, hopefully it would it would work. Uh, uh, for definitely will be on that balcony, our balcony with flags, whatever, but we want uh, the flag to be the entire day on the building might be more challenging. Jerusalem is still Jerusalem. Uh, uh, um, so it's not, to go back to your question, it's not as effective as voting to the Knesset, but it's a political tool that we have. Not to use that political tool is a huge mistake, okay? Uh, uh, um, when, when you have a, a democratic, uh, um, when you have elections and you don't vote and others do, it gives them uh, the power that you could have had. And we get it when it comes to our presidential uh, elections or to the county elections. We must get it when it comes to the, to the Zionist movement. Otherwise we are letting go of, of, of the Zionist dream. This is as dramatic as it is, okay? If, listen, when I said that Israel is uh, one of its most critical times, I wasn't exaggerating. It's obvious that one can live in a democracy that is not Jewish. One cannot live in a Jewish state that is not a democracy. It, it would not last. We will not raise our children in a state that is not a democracy. It would be the end of the Zionist endeavor. Are we willing to be in, living in a generation when the Zionist endeavor is, 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 is at that risk? So this is why we don't sleep at night. Sometimes, some nights in the last few months, I wake up at 2 a.m., I look to my left, I see my wife, she's not asleep as well. Okay, we are both, you know, and, and the days when it was in the beginning were even really, we, we, we couldn't smile, we couldn't do anything. It was like being in shock. So, so this is how dramatic it is. Uh, uh, I'm encouraged by the streets. So let's be optimistic and being optimistic is always better. Uh, um, so uh, uh, I hope that we will win this game. Yes, please. The yeah, yeah, let's take a few questions. Yes. The American government has been pretty critical in this for the last few months, just the last few days. Settlements. Is that helpful? Is that hurtful? To does B D not care? I, I'm just. I'm. I, I'm a lefty, so of course it helps. <laughs> you know, I think that that. Uh, that's my question. Does it make a difference to, to the to the right winger? The fact that Israeli Prime Minister was not invited still to the to the White House, um, it's, it's notable and it's noticed. Okay, so uh, uh, after uh, a few bad years with the Trump administration, uh, we do see that. Uh, um, there is some price that is now being uh, collected. Is it great for Israel in the greater picture? I'm not sure. But uh, uh, um, I, I think that uh, um, what, what, what Biden's administration is doing so far is definitely in place in my, in my, in my eyes. I think that uh, it sends the right messages. Yeah. Thanks for introducing a lot of new thoughts. Uh, I was just thinking of uh, someone tried to, has tried over the years to explain the game of cricket to me. I still don't understand it, but I'm trying. <laughs> so, uh, but in in this country, we have our big problems too, right versus left. Some would call it a cold civil war. I mean, it's almost like what's happening in Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know how we're going to solve things here. How, how can you do it with a... A, a right wing that's uh, a, a religious uh, hardcore and a person like Netanyahu who wants to accrue power who's not even religious and uh, he's simply uh, you know bringing in the right wing uh, it's it's and and so my the, the real question I have is do you think the the worldwide phenomenon of uh, country Leaders of countries accruing power, wanting to become dictator, is something that's that's going along. That even in Israel, that it's this, it's like a, a, a new a new wave of uh, authoritarianism. So we are indeed live in an era where uh, populists right. in some countries are uh, taking over. 
And uh, it happened again in, uh, in, uh, in the countries that we mentioned, in Hungary, Poland, and other places. Uh, uh, I think that um, what we read now from intellectuals in Poland, that they are looking up to the way we deal with it in Israel and the way that we consistently, you know, in the streets, because they felt that they left the streets too early. And uh, I hope then that if in Israel we uh, will be able to, uh, to win this battle, that it would have an influence on other countries that are suffering there, uh, I can tell you from our, our own uh, community, we have a Kehila congregation uh, 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 in Budapest. Um, and and uh, what they are suffering from urban regime, because it's a liberal community, because it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is felt. Now it's a small congregation, it's not, um, it's not huge, but, but, but I can tell you that they feel every day life, how life, a different life is because of that change. Uh, um, I hope that in Israel, uh, the results would be dramatically different. And it might be even be, might even be, it's a very optimistic kind of scenario, but it might even be, uh, a, few, a few months ago, President Herzog said, and I was listening to that sentence, he said, sometimes a crisis of that manner brings uh, 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 society to a constitutional moment, a constitutional moment that we didn't have for many, many, many years. Now, that constitutional moment definitely could not be achieved in this Knesset. In this Knesset, God forbid, if they would legislate the constitution, it would be the worst of the worst. But, you know, it's politics. It could be that the next Knesset, because of would would would, would feel that, uh, uh, and we will have enough people uh, uh, elected that would give uh, uh, um, uh, that sentiment of a constitutional moment uh, uh, some political uh, feasibility, and, and maybe a protected Bill of Rights could be achieved. Okay, it's big. Now, uh, uh, we are in such a crisis now, it may be resolved in the next message. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm too optimistic and dreaming, but uh, I heard him well. And uh, I loved the phrase, constitutional moment. Yes, please. So, I just wanted to ask you again, because when you said, you really explained it so well. I think I'm, I'm trying to get and I want to say in terms of like the 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 first we took the stuff that the country don't like it yet and don't understand it. And I think that would really help the young people say like, oh wow, look what's happening right now. And I think that would be great to do the really change. And yeah. then, uh, we, of course, we will be accused with a pink wash, but okay, I get it too. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a legit kind of argument to me. Yeah. yeah. Like, I'm going on the Federation ship. Hmm. You had mentioned that you want people to, to reach out to me. Your Federation is Metro West. Metro West. Oh, great. Are you encouraging us to ask like a federation to say something to Netanyahu to deal with it? Is that what you were saying? You were saying something? Definitely. And I know that Dov is 100% on the same page on that. By the way, I, I, I see him in the gatherings of uh, of uh, of the Board of Governors, and he's one of the federation executives that do speak about these issues without blinking. Uh, and yes, when you are there, you are there with, I don't know, many buses, right? It's a big mission. So maybe it's huge. Yeah, I hope it's, I hope they're still not protesting, but maybe it would be a good idea for us to do a protest and get I don't know. Could be. When are you coming? It's uh, beginning of July. July second. I, I mean, I hope it's already. July second. That is coming now. Yeah. So hopefully we'll win the battle and there will be no need. But uh, uh but yes, yeah, definitely. I think I think it's a it's, it's a it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. Really, it's a, uh, I'm not sure if it, you know maybe everything will be sold, but uh, yes. By the way, I see people. Yeah, it was on. Right? Yeah. So um, there were multiple. There was demonstrations at the GA, but then there were many of us who um, who were there the night before, who then were in Kaplan uh, for Yom Hatzmaut. Yeah. Yom Hatzmaut, and then. And then the following Shabbat. So yeah. there, there were lots of people, federation 
And it's a great idea. And and it's a, a, a federation mission of 40 uh, or 500 people, it's huge. It can have an impact and you should be vocal and do what, what is needed. I'm happy. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, imagine possibly a constitutional crisis could result in something good. It, in, in Chinese, the word for crisis is composed of two characters, danger and opportunity. Hmm. So you could use that. Uh, I could use that. <laughs> so I'd like to, uh, you have a... <laughs> yeah, one thing that wasn't mentioned is that this government is also cracking down very severely on the Arab population. And I haven't heard a lot of protesting of that. Uh, and, and for someone whose family barely escaped Nazi Germany, it's very scary because it sounds to me if I were an Arab, I would have felt just like a Jew in 1935 and, or 37 in Germany. So I'm not sure that I agree with you completely. As someone who fought against the occupation for many years, I'm not sure that it's the same one-on-one -on -one like you described uh, uh, Jews in Germany in 35 or 36. Uh, yet I do get that it's a huge stain on our Zionist identity and our democratic uh, identity. I get it. Uh, and it's not for us to, to deliberate now uh, uh, if uh, only Israel is, uh, uh, is, is, is the fault or it's a joint kind of fault or whatever. It's definitely something that after 56 years that we uh, uh, have 3 million uh, people that uh, do not want us to govern them, that it's a huge challenge that uh, needs to be solved and hopefully it will be solved in our lifetime. I'm not sure, but hopefully it, uh, uh, it will. And by the way, when we have a different leadership, both in the Palestinian side and in the Israeli side, I think it can be solved way quicker than one thinks. Okay, it's, uh, but it, it's a big, big, big problem. Now, it, 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 the World Zionist Organization has some uh, uh, effect on that too, okay, in KKL, we blocked uh, purchase of land in the territories. Again, we do not publicize it because we don't want to give uh, motivation to the other side to try every, okay, but we blocked it. Something that was done for years is now not being conducted. And within Israel, uh, um, the protest, th this is true, the Arabs did not do not participate in the protest against the judicial reform. I, I, I do not accuse them. They, they have bigger things to uh, to worry about, although they will be one of the minorities that would be severely affected if indeed this legislation is legislated. Uh, um, th that's simply the fact. So so it is, uh, and it's 10 percent of the Jewish population went to the streets, zero percent of the Arab population went to, to the streets. And it's also because when we go on those demonstrations, and I think it's a great symbol, we hold the Israeli flag. You see dozens Tens of thousands of Israeli flags. Would an Arab in Israel would carry the Israeli flag uh, joyfully? No, it's it's a it's a challenge. So uh, they couldn't uh, uh, buy in into those uh, demonstrations. I I do get it. Uh, um, listen, what we had in the last government for the first time, I'm sure that it would not be the last time. The fact that we had in the Bennett uh, Lapid government uh, an Arab party that was part of that government, it's a breakthrough. And the leadership of uh, Mansour Abbas is like uh, uh, fresh air to our politics. And you know what, I have no, uh, I'm not accusing him now for flirting with Netanyahu. And he is flirting with Netanyahu. And I think rightly he should flirt with Netanyahu. Okay, he needs to, to bring achievement to his people. And uh, it's like calling the bluff of Netanyahu, but if he could get from Netanyahu, what he was able to get from, uh, from uh, Bennett and Lapid, let it get it, let it get it from him. So, so uh, uh, it will change Israeli politics, I hope, because otherwise it will be not right and uh, it would prevent the ability of the more liberal camp to be back in power. Uh, I'd like to conclude with Herzl. That, uh, um, you know, if you would have read his diaries, uh, especially the things that he wrote six months before the Congress, you would be devastated. He was so depressed. He was writing, the Jews of Vienna do not help me. The Jews of England only talk. The Jews of France hardly hear. I hear back from them. I was promised this. I was promised this. You see the level of frustration that he had from the Jews. Uh, uh, and still he was able to cope with it and to be there. 
at the end of the day, sometimes uh, uh, when we are in such a low level, it doesn't mean that the future, even the future of the Zionist movement that doesn't look that good now, will not be you know, in, in, in a better position. Herzl proved it again and again. And the, the Zionist Congress that we just uh, so wonderfully described, there were fistfights and tricks and uh, 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 Herzl was in the room, and Weizmann left the room with uh, with a big group of the, it was the the democratic fraction, and they left the room and went to the balcony to boo him. Herzl, who would boo Herzl? You know, it's it's uh, it's a uh, the thing. This is the nature of uh, our endeavor. So so and and look, he was able to achieve uh, the establishment of the state. So let's be optimistic. Let's fight and fight and fight and be engaged and be activists and vote to the Congress. This is the most important, the most tangible tool that we have in our uh, hands and hopefully we'll be able to make it. Toda